<clears throat> My pleasure to be with you. <coughs> I need it to do the thing. Most of you probably do not know me. I did have a little connection with the full gospel businessmen. I used to go into Woodford Prison with Rex Eglamese from Tanner. There's a real origin. He was brought up in Australia because one of the Kanakas that were brought here, his family, and we used to go in every fifth Sunday. And there was quite a work went on in, in Woodford at that time. I used to enjoy going with Rex. He would play the guitar and sing, and I would sit in the front and teach, just like I teach in a Bible college. So that's what I plan to do now. I am a teacher, all right? <coughs> so what I'm going to take you through tonight is an introduction to uh, an area we want to cover to try and put in some solid foundations, which is the theme of the conference. To do it, I was quite impressed with the, um, the uh, brochure that came out to uh, invite you to this conference. It stirred my mind in many things. <clears throat> I'll just give you a background. I was flying from Auckland to Brisbane quite a number of years ago and it was a clear day. We are halfway. <clears throat> I was on the left-hand side of the plane near the window. I liked the window. My wife sits the other side. I look out the window because I like to daydream and as I'm coming halfway there below me, clearly out of the ocean is a rock sitting out of the ocean and a little smaller rock beside it. And I just marvelled because it was a crystal clear day and I could look down and, was, and the sea was quite smooth and there was looking down on a big rock out of the middle of the ocean, halfway between Auckland and Brisbane. Then number of years later I heard about a British naval vessel that hit that rock <laughs> and they had to take it back to New Zealand to be repaired and I thought I looked down I could see no lighthouse there's no lighthouse on that rock and I just wondered whether there was any light on the rock at all because lighthouses have purpose their object is to warn so that you don't get shipwrecked on the rock you don't hit it the other thought was this, and it's on YouTube, you can pick it up. My son's told me, about, told me about it, and I found it quite interesting. Whether it's true or not, I have no idea, because a lot on YouTube, you don't know whether it's true or not, all right? <clears throat> but there was this uh, fleet of naval vessels from the US heading down the coast of France to go through the Mediterranean, and they're coming past, I think it's uh, Cape Finisterre, they're coming past there, heading down that way. Anyway, the man in charge of the main vessel saw the light ahead and he sent a message to that light and he said, shift 15 degrees to the north. The message came back to the vessel, you shift 15 degrees to the north. And he proceeded to tell them who he was. He was in charge of this big naval vessel, big one from the U US, and he had other vessels with him. You shift. 15 degrees north. The message came back, you shift 15 degrees north. So it went on to finally this fellow said, look we've got four submarines, I think it was, and we've got so many destroyers and this is a main naval place from the US. <laughs> he said, you shift 15 degrees north. Back came, silence for a while, back came the reply. There are two humans here, a parrot and a cat, and he said, we're on solid ground, you shift north. This is the lighthouse on Cape Finisterre. <laughs> <laughs> there was silence for quite a period and it said received and obeyed yes. <clears throat> you see lighthouses give warning so you don't make shipwreck on the rock the rock is Christ and the lighthouse is meant to warn you that it's solid rock and if you try to take it on you will wreck yourself right. you make shipwreck concerning the faith. They are the words of Scripture. Concerning the resurrection, they have erred from the faith and have made shipwreck. So I'm going to take you through Scriptures tonight because there is a burden in Scripture, I find, as I go through the latter part of the letters of Peter, Paul, John, 
and James, I find there is a great burden, an increasing burden, concerning the conditions that precede the coming of the Lord Jesus into this world a second time. To the nation of Israel. I'm not touching the church at this point. I'm saying to the nation of Israel. There are conditions pictured very strongly and there are intense warnings concerning the conditions we will face and are facing and are rapidly increasing in our own circumstances in the days in which we find ourselves. So I plan to go through it like that and take you through. So what I'll do is take you through the lessons I learnt from your brochure. All right, that's the, the lighthouse I want it. So I want to take you through on a PowerPoint presentation. The scriptures I've put on it are out of the NIV, 1984. Now some of you and a lot of you will not agree with the NIV. All right, translation, let me explain. I teach in Bible colleges over a lot of places in the world. I teach mostly in the nations of the Pacific at present. They all have NIV study Bibles. Are you clear? They all have NIV study Bibles from America. So I have to handle the scriptures they have. My memory is back in King, old King James, all right, because I'm old. <laughs> that's where I, I've read the scriptures so much, but that's what I use. So if some of them come up and you find a bit of difference, and there will be, concerning the New King James you may have, or you may have other ones, New English Standard Version, I don't know what you have, but whatever you have, there may be a variation, but the sense there will be mostly correct in what you get. So I'm going to take you through the scriptures and we're going to have a look at, where's this white thing, Link? Mm. Uh, no, battery no, battery. no battery in it? Battery. All right, we'll have to operate from here. No, yeah, start with the... Um, Do you want the PowerPoint? No, I want the PowerPoint. Yes, all right. We'll go step by step through the PowerPoint. It will come up on the screen here, and that's the easiest way. Should work. Anything there? That's that one. Flat to the top. Yeah. Hit it with a hammer. <coughs> Operate it from a computer if you can't do it from there. <coughs> I don't like electronics. I teach with a Bible in the Pacific. <laughs> And I expect them to have their Bible, and, and because I want them to see it, it's in their Bible. I just do it from the computer. We'll just go through step by step, and I'll proceed to give some thoughts as we go through concerning what you see. There is a lighthouse set on a rock. <coughs> so the two objects are there. The lighthouse is solidly set. That is, it rests solid on the rock. If any light is going to shine from you and I, it must shine solid on the rock. Christ in you is the hope of glory. When we speak, it is to speak as the oracles of God. That is, we are to speak under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. It is the word of God that we are to carry from our lips. It's what the apostles carried under the power of the Holy Spirit and it's meant to be what we should carry. It's not my thoughts, it's not my opinions, it is what God says in his word that is the authority. Yes. So let's go through and see what happens. All right, the rock of our salvation. <coughs> Meaning, <coughs> it's where we have our foundations. Remove the lighthouse and all you've got is a rock. Central to the whole of Scripture is the stone the builders rejected. It has been made the, the, the chief cornerstone, the sure foundation, the rock Christ Jesus. The lighthouse is situated on the rock. 
Whoops. Will it not go still? I'll go to the next one. All right. This is the brochure for the convention that we had here. All ah, right. The lighthouse is situated on a rock. Full gospel businessmen are part of the light shining in the world. True? We are not on a, the only light. But it is the light, the same light is to be carried because it's the light of the glorious gospel of Christ that shines into the human heart that changes the whole being of the person. I never forget. I generally don't talk about experiences, all right, but I was at Woodford one day standing at the front watching these prisoners come in. About a third of the prisoners were coming to the Bible studies. And this fellow came in and I never forgot it. He was covered with tattoos, it's pretty normal. But he was, he was dark, he was lost, he was totally hopeless. His eyes were just dull, he had no hope and he was in despair. It was written all over him. And he came in and they all sat down and he was sitting near there. Uh, there. And I just sit there, I teach. As I taught, I watched the water start to flow. And it poured out of his eyes. And I hand the meeting back, because I don't conclude it, I hand the meeting back. Afterwards, that man came up to me and I saw a miracle because he had been totally changed internally and it was reflected externally. Everything of that despair was gone. And I realised what an immense work God can do by his word. He regenerates by his truth. That's how it happens. Peter said, born again, not of corruptible seed, but incorruptible by the word of God. And they quote the Old Testament scriptures to support the truth they are preaching. God forbid that we should ever depart from that kind of ministry. The word of God carries the message of God. We don't have to interpret it, we have to give it. We have to proclaim it and set it forth plainly as to what the God's Word is actually saying and give it its sense. <laughs> the stone the builders rejected has become the capstone or the chief cornerstone. This is the Lord's doing, not ours. It's God's gospel, not man's gospel. Paul said, I didn't receive it of man. I was not taught it. It came by revelation from God. Our whole authority for the message we carry has come from God himself and the apostle to the Gentile world is Paul. I'm a Gentile. The epistles from Romans through to Hebrews are Paul. You are Gentiles. I'm a Gentile. Where's your authority? Paul is the apostle, not an apostle, the apostle to the Gentile world. Where's our authority gone when we lose Paul? 500 years today, this month, no, it's in a couple of months. October. October. 500 years ago, Martin Luther nailed his thesis on the Wittenberg University doors, which brought about what we call today the Reformation, the reforming back to the doctrines of the New Testament apostles. Justification by faith alone, through grace alone, and Scripture alone is the authority for that message. We have to return to the basics again. All right? <laughs> I travel a lot. I'm sorry, I travel a lot. And I have watched the collapse take place. The collapse of authority. That's why marriage is such a mess today. The fault's not in the world, the fault's in the church. Amen. That's where the fault rises. We've lost our authority. Marriage was an institution by God and God gave its values when he gave marriage. And that's our standard. We don't vary from that. God instituted marriage. We are a creation. Marriage is what God planned and purposed. So its values belong from God, not from man. Once we give up creation, we give up our whole values. And I've watched it. I've just spent two and a half months in Vanuatu with the parliamentarians, with the education department and with the whole of the Vanuatu Christian churches, the pastors. 
because they do not want to be governed by the Western world's thinking on evolution. They believe in a creator and they want their education system to have creator in it. So we are watching something take place and God forbid that it should cease, it must go on. When you come to these areas, he says, this is the Lord's doing. It's marvellous in our eyes, isn't it? This is the day the Lord has made. This one. He raised him from the dead. The beginning of the first fruits of a new creation. It's the Lord's doing. Today is the day of salvation. Today, if you will hear his voice, this day is a day of God's grace. That's the day we live in today. God forbid we should mix it with any work of man to make our approach to God acceptable. We are grounded in our approach to God solely on the work Christ has done. There are no steps to be built up to the altar. Man's works to try and get up onto the sacrifice. Forget it. Let the shame of your nakedness appear. No righteousness covering from Christ. You add your works and you've got nothing. Where has our message gone? You know, I thought through this and I thought back through Martin Luther and all that goes with it. And this is what I thought. 500 years ago, Martin Luther, on the subject of Romans and Galatians, studied intensely and came to understand the truth of justification by faith alone. What was he speaking out against? The dropping of the coins into the box so the soul could go from purgatory to heaven. So prayers could be said and masses could be said so the soul could get into heaven. That's what he stood against. Since that time, the Catholic system of teaching introduced Mary, olatry, immaculate conception, she had no sin, bodily assumption into heaven, she's co-redemptress with Christ, she's a heavenly intercessor, and she's the queen of heaven. And we have not raised a voice. In fact, we are going into the Catholic system in thinking. We don't raise our voice. Why? It'll create stirs. Isn't it true? Have we lost our authority? Which is scripture? Can we stand with people like Martin Luther who was willing to stand there and say, here I stand, I will not recant. I think it's time we needed to raise our voices very strongly on what we believe about salvation and what we believe about the gospel. So I'm going to take you through in this weekend and lay a foundation I trust. I'm not dealing with the book of Romans. I'm not dealing with the book of Galatians. I decided to approach it from a different aspect. I'm going to deal with things which occur in the scriptures. And the Bible says this. Romans 15 verse 4, it says this. Whatever was written aforetime, meaning the scriptures, was written for our learning, that we through patience and comfort of the scriptures might have hope. Where's your patience come from? Where's your comfort come from? What will take you through the trials? Patience means you go through the testings because you know what the end is. We through patience and comfort of the scriptures, we have hope. I tell them, I don't tell you, Jerry, I'm, I'm in the Pacific, I was, <laughs> their humour is different to our humour, all right? The humour of Ireland is because we are Western and they are not. But I told them I never forgot. You heard of Tom Frew? Yeah. Some of you heard of Tom Frew. I think this came from him. But I never forgot it. So I told them about it. Paddy was in the pub with his friend. I should get Len to tell this kind of thing. I just tell the story. <laughs> Paddy was in the pub with his friend. And his mate came in with a big fish. And he said to, Paddy said to the man, how did you get it? He said, well, I take my mate, I hang him over the bridge, enter the bridge like this down in the, over the water. And he said, as the water's going by, he sees the fish, he grabs the fish, and well, that's how we get the fish. So Paddy says to his mate, all right, let's go, we'll try. So down they go to the bridge. 
And so he gets his mate, takes him by the ankles, hangs him over like this. No fish, hangs him over. Suddenly there's a voice yells out, Take me up, there's a train coming. <laughs> <laughs> Wrong bridge. <laughs> <laughs> and I said to them, listen, the pathway ahead is dark, but there's a light at the end of the tunnel. That's where we are today. The world is anti-Jew and anti-Christian. And it's time we faced it. If we're not going to stand now, we won't. It's time that we must take a stand on the absolute authority of Scripture for what we believe. We have a parliamentarian in, in, in the parliament in Vanuatu. He's been to the creation work down in camp a few years ago down in, in Phillip Island. He said he never slept the first night because it was by Dr. Ferguson on Islam. And this man travels everywhere, has co constant contact with Muslims, and you may know there's two mosques now, one on Tanner and one in, in Vila. But it was the, the fact of what was happening in marriage, the same-sex issues that they were facing in Vanuatu, and he stood up and rebuked. He said, the gospel was brought to us. We have values. Our culture tells us it's wrong. Why don't you stand? And he's very strong. Thank God for godly people who will stand up in parliament and let their values be known. Because it's amazing when one man takes a stand, others join him, and soon you've got quite a lot ready to stand. I think we are seeing a little bit of it happen in America. A little bit of a stand taking place in some areas. There's a long way ahead. There's a long road ahead. It's gone so far. We have kept silent. We have allowed. And things have come in. We've not risen up to stand. As I look back over my life and my time through Kedron Teachers College, I suffered. I, there were consequences for standing, but I realized I didn't stand as strong as I should have myself. I realized the only thing that should be in the education system of the world in its university is the Bible, and Martin Luther said that. Once the Bible is not the ground of your university, your university will be of no value. And we shy away, oh, train them up as Christians, give them the Bible, and they won't be able to face the world. Friends, the only way our young people will face the world is to be convinced the Bible is real history. That Adam and Eve were real. There was a Garden of Eden that sin entered. And that's why the world is in the mess today. And God's got the only answer. Not till we get to a solid understanding. Your Bible is history. Real history from beginning to end. And we're in the middle of history now. And it's all written into the Bible. And if we understand our Bible, we know where we are in time. Yes. Don't we? Yep. So when we come to this, it says, This is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. God has made this day of salvation. It's a source of joy to us. <clears throat> This is Jesus quoting from Matthew 21. He said to those that were there, Therefore I tell you, the kingdom of God will be taken from you and given to a nation that will bring forth the fruit thereof. Tell me, who's he talking to? Your Bible tells you at the end that the Pharisees knew that he was telling this parable against them. Just imagine standing there and knowing what he's saying, he's hitting you. What's going to be your response? Get rid of him. I don't want to hear any more. That's what happened. Get rid of him. I don't want to hear any more. Stop confronting us with the Holy One of Israel is what the Israelites told the prophets, the true prophets. Stop confronting us with the Holy One of Israel. We don't want to be faced with the holiness of God. Is there a time we need to hear that God is holy? It's now. He will not look on sin. He cannot stand sin. He's a purer eyes than to behold iniquity. He cannot look on sin, says Habakkuk. 
So what chance will you and I have in the presence of a holy God? What chance will any person ever have in the presence of a holy God if Christ is not their salvation? So he says this, God is sovereign over the waters of the sea. I was amazed as I went through, I put a few scriptures down. This is what the Lord says, who stirs up the sea so that its waves roar, the Lord Almighty is his name. So the Lord stirs up the sea. Who still the roaring of the seas, the roaring of its waves and the turmoil of the nations. Please notice, it links the turmoil of the sea to the turmoil of the nations. Say, so why do you say that? Because when Daniel had his first vision and he opens up on the vision that he saw of the animals that constituted the kingdoms that would persecute the nation of Israel, starting with Babylonia, he says, the four winds blew on the sea. The sea was unrested and out of that unrested state of the nations rose first Babylon, then the Medo-Persian Empire, then the Grecian Empire, then the Roman Empire and finally out of the Roman Empire there's another one. And what are you seeing today? You're seeing this term, you're going to see the nations in turmoil. Amen. The sign of Jesus coming is not just the gathering of Israel back into the land. It is the circumstances that will happen now in that land that tell us the coming of the Lord draws near. The whole issue of the Temple Mount and everything that goes with it is going to be before the eyes of the world, Jerusalem and the Temple Mount. You can see it before you. I hope you don't believe in replacement theology. That is, the church has replaced Israel and Israel has no future. If I have trodden on your toes, I'm sorry, but I think you need to search Scripture very carefully because the same Scriptures that said he was going to scatter Israel in the same context says, I will gather you back in the latter days and I'll do better than I did to you in former times. Tremendous promises are made. There are godless people for the most part. The Pride March, eh? a month ago in, the, in Jerusalem, the Pride March. When we were flying out of Ben Gurion Airport, it was after the Pope had left, but there was a whole lot of Hasidic Jews with the black hats and the, the curls down here, putting putting cartons through because they're flying out. Two days later, found out where they were going. A homosexual conference in New York. No wonder the Bible says in Revelation 11, it says the, the bodies of those two witnesses who are killed lie on the street of the city where their Lord was crucified, which spiritually is called Sodom. You've just had a pride march in Sodom. With Sodom, just down the valley there, ashes, you cannot see it anymore. They, they, they've got rainbow colours on their flag. The Israeli flag with the Star of David and it's coloured violet and go blue, green, yellow, orange, red, draped over their shoulders, mocking the God of heaven, saying, bring down the fire. They don't know what they're doing. They're controlled by the desire. What's the answer to all this? If Romans chapter 1 was not there, I don't think we would have an answer. Because Romans chapter 1 verse 16 and 17 and you should know your Bible, you should memorize your Bible, you should think upon it, you should meditate on it. He said, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. It is the power of God. It is. The gospel is. Amen. The word of the gospel, the word of truth doesn't rest in you or me. It's God's word. Paul says, I'm not ashamed of it. It is the power of God unto salvation to everyone who believes. Jew first and also the Gentile. Why? In that gospel, a righteousness from God is revealed. We haven't got any. Prove first of all that we're locked under sin, that we're totally hopeless, that we're utterly lost, and you have a candidate for salvation. Till your repentance is brought about in the human heart. 
which means a breaking before God of sorrow of how we have offended a holy God. Not for the consequences of my sin, but I have offended the holiness of God. Not till that comes upon a human heart by the Holy Spirit, the first work, He will convince the world of sin because they don't believe on me. Jesus said, if you don't believe I am He, you'll die in your sins. Where's the conviction of sin gone in our world? When I first went to Fiji, the Assembly of God was called the Church of Tears. Because in the meetings, at the night meetings, they wouldn't leave. The floor was wet with people weeping and getting right with God. Don't see much of that anymore. It's clappy happy. Chew the gum while you come to Christ and say, yeah, I'll come. I'm glad you invited me. No conviction of sin. No understanding I'm a sinner and I need to be saved. God is angry with sin and that anger has been poured on his only son. And your Bible says in 2 Peter chapter 1, it says this, there were false prophets among the people, just as there will be false teachers among you. They'll secretly, privily bring in damnable heresies, even denying the Lord who brought them. Say, that doesn't happen. Right now, it's happening. There was a movement just put out of the UK Evangelical Union. A big movement. Because the man married male couples in his church. I hesitate to name organisations and that. I'll just leave it at that. But I looked it up while I was in Vanuatu because I had to find out where he was at. When you give up your foundations of Genesis, you end up where that man is now. Marriage is no problem to him to marry two men. I have played to my principles, national principles in the Pacific, the testimony of, I've got to think of his name, the Southern Baptist pastor, minister, who turned around the whole Baptist movement from liberal, oh. Albert Moeller. Because I knew Seru Rokasau, a godly man, the principal of the Assembly of God Bible College in Fiji. I've known him, I brought him, trained him as a student. And I said, listen to this, Seru, listen to it. Because this is what this man faced. When he tried to turn around, the whole Southern Baptist movement had gone totally liberal. He said, this is what you'll face, this kind of opposition. There is opposition once you stand for truth today. But tell me, is it worth it? Some people have said, why do you worry, Morris? Prophecy is going to take its path. Friends, if we don't stand for truth, I will be accountable to God one day, and so will you. I will have to stand in his presence, and he's going to ask me, what did you do with my word? How did you handle my truth? That's why the Bible says that we may not be ashamed rightly dividing the word of God. So when we come to these areas here, it says, I am the Lord your God, he says, who stirs up the sea so that its waves roar. The Lord Almighty is his name. You know in your Bible, God has reserved one word in the Hebrew for the flood, Noah's flood. He's reserved one word in the Greek for Noah's flood. In the Hebrew, it is mabul. So when you see the word mabul, the Hebrew word mabul, you see God is talking about Noah's flood because it, it's a different word used for any other kind of flood, whether it's an army or whether it's a flood of water. So when you're reading Psalm 29 and verse 10, it says, The Lord sat king over the flood, Mabu. Was he in charge? Was God in charge of the flood? When every living being outside of the ark perished, buried in sediment, underwater, all over the continents of the world now called the fossil record. 
Was God in charge of that action? Yes. Don't tell me God loves sin. He hates sin. And he has to deal with sin. But God is merciful. He warned and he warned and he warned. And they refused the invitation. The door was open seven days, meaning finish, complete, perfect. It'll save you, trust me. And not a response from anyone. And God said to Noah, finally, go into the ark with all your family. You only have I seen righteous before me in this tenth generation. Just one man left in the tenth generation. That's the history of our world. And yet it's not even taught as a historical event in any university of secular kind all over the world. Yet here in Queensland, the man who started Griffith University, which is totally anti-creation, Sancho and Coast University, Ray Nella, atheist, his wife is an atheist, and he's studying stratigraphy, the laying of, of layers laid down underwater. He's been all over the world, that's his work. And he's working on Stradbroke Island, looking at stratigraphy, and he became convinced by his world work, there was a worldwide flood before he became a Christian. <laughs> Interesting. That is the man we're depending on now to lead the question of a Christian university, which we have, want to hope to have an outreach into Vanuatu. God is doing something when he saves atheists like that. Isn't he? Yes. So if God is reviving the fact of the Bible being absolute authority, real history, it's just as it happened, that's how it's written. I think it's time we got aboard and we supported anything that stands for the absolute authority of Scripture today because it is under attack from every side. That's our position. <clears throat> we now deal with the question of the light <laughs> because the lighthouse's purpose is to give light. The purpose of the Christian church is to give light. That's why when you tap into Revelation chapters 1, 2 and 3, you have seven lampstands and we are told, we not have to guess, the seven lampstands are the seven churches. And I used to wonder about these seven churches. I hear a lot, I read a lot. <coughs> You'll just have to accept... Nicholson's lot. <laughs> I can take you on pathway after pathway. That has thrilled me. But I'll take you this. This is what has thrilled me so much. I began to question and I said, God, you have shown Israel their future ahead of them every time you talk to them. He started with Abraham, eh? Deep sleep there and, and horror of great darkness fell on Abram, remember? And the offerings were made there and horror of darkness and God spoke to him and said, 400 years your people will be slaves in a land not their own. At the end of 400 years I'll bring them back. So God told 400 years of history to Abram before it ever happened. What did he do with Moses? Before they go into the promised land, Deuteronomy 28, 29, Moses is told, telling Israel, when you go into the land, you're going to turn after their gods. You're going to do what they did and God's going to scatter you through the world. That's history. 2,000 years of it. Isn't it? But chapter 30, Deuteronomy chapter 30, in the latter days, I will gather you back into the land. So where are we? We're in the latter days. We're seeing God fulfill His word. Exactly. All the prophets told Israel what would befall them? God is warned. This is going to happen. Turn, turn. Why will you die? So if God was consistent with Israel, and he was, the whole of your Old Testament, what about the church? Has God taught the church its history? Because if God is going to be consistent, God is going to teach the church its history before it ever happens. And he has he has. Take your map when you go home, your Bible map if you like, go to your Bible, go to the back of your Bible, and go and look in that map. You'll see 
the Isle of Patmos. Up from that you'll see Ephesus. Then take a pencil or a pen. Start Ephesus, Smyrna, Pergamos, Thyatira, Sardis, Philadelphia, Laodicea. They don't go like that. They go like that. What do you see? A sequence of history. That's what you're seeing. And if you don't believe me, I'll just take one instance out. The church at Thyatira. You suffer that woman Jezebel, which calls herself a prophetess, to seduce my servants and cause them to eat things sacrificed to idols and to commit sexual immorality. I gave her space to repent, but she didn't. So I'm going to cast her into a bed of suffering. What are you seeing? The Reformation and the Counter-Reformation. She refused to repent. The Jesuits started the Counter-Reformation. Your present, your present Pope is a Jesuit. First one. True? You're looking at Thyatai. You're looking back in history. And you're seeing the Reformation told to you by God. I gave her time to repent. Luther was what? A Catholic. Calvin was what? A Catholic. Zwingli was what? A Catholic. Hus was what? A Catholic. And they called on the church. Change. Turn. You've gone the wrong way. And so the Reformation took place. And these are the words of God and I tremble as I read it. And those who commit adultery with her I'll cast them into great tribulation. Who's that? The Protestant church. You and I are living at a time when it's happening. When a certain well-known TV evangelist in South Africa sent a prophetic message to Ekman in Sweden in charge of one of the largest Pentecostal churches in Sweden to go into the Catholic church. Ekman obeyed. And I read his testimony one year after he had been in the Catholic Church. And he said, to me now, the intercession of Mary is very precious. And the Mass is very real. Don't tell me it isn't happening. I thank God the reverse is also taking place. There are Catholics coming out into the light. And we looked at the Bible study I'm taking up north of Gympie. They had, I don't know how many of them are ex-Catholics. Yes. You know, you remember Caloundra. You remember what happened in Caloundra. That, that church in Caloundra. A lot of Catholics came out of that Caloundra Catholic Church. Because there was a, quite a move of God taking place. So tell me, where are we at? In my understanding, there is an absolute need today for as full gospel businessmen, you really preach the full gospel. And I'm going to open out to you, when we go through these studies which we have, what is the full gospel? Because I remember, as I was listening to the testimony here this evening, I was thinking, you see there was an African slave who was a cotton chipper. Came back to his home. The home was burnt to the ground. His wife was gone. His children were gone. He had nothing. He penned the words. All that I need is in Jesus. All that I need is in Him. Those words which have been sung so much originate from that. Nothing left. All that I need is in Jesus. Your justification, your sanctification, and your glorification are all in Jesus. And that is the full gospel of the Apostle Paul. You say, you don't believe in divine healing? Yes, I do, or I wouldn't have a daughter. And I've experienced certain things myself. I'm saying the centrality of Christ and what he means is a full salvation. Who will lay anything to the charge of God's elect? 
It is God who justifies. Where have we gone with the power of the gospel to tell them that in the courtroom of God, God has declared you righteous in his sight because of what Christ has done for you? Where is the ability today? Because I read in the book of Galatians, Paul said, who's put a spell over you? Who's bewitched you that you should not obey the truth? Before your very eyes, Christ was placated. He was opened out before you. His whole work. Talk about powerful preaching. Jesus said, I, if I be lifted up, I will draw all men to me. This spake he of the death he was going to die. The centrality of the cross, the burial and the resurrection of Christ are three central truths, particularly the middle one we have avoided. We've not seen its significance. Peter preached it, day of Pentecost. Paul preached it, Acts 13, and we don't mention it. The tremendous truth that lay with his burial. If we get that far, I will deal with it. You have realized by now I'm a teacher. I've got a whole lot more on that screen. I will never stick to PowerPoint. I can't stick to notes. I just have to preach what my, my comes to my mind. And I trust it has helped you in your understanding. I will teach as best I can. I will try and limit myself. There's so much inside here. I find it very difficult. But I will try and give you three clear teachings that originate particularly from the Old Testament, but find their fulfillment in the New. So clear in the Bible. So I'm going to take you through tomorrow. I have you tomorrow morning for the first session. Because I have no clock. I thought, I've got no clock to know what the time is anyway. Praise God for that. <laughs> what is it? Time? Yeah. Tomorrow, I'm going to take you through one verse in your Bible, right at the beginning of a Bible, which lays the unchangeable nature of salvation. God laid it down. Genesis, if you want to read it when you go home, Genesis 3 verse 24, it lays the unchangeable nature of God's salvation. We'll take a full session more to go through that, just that one verse. The second time, I want to deal with an issue called the Day of Atonement. So important to Israel, but so important to the church in its message. The last one, I want to deal with leprosy. God's teaching on leprosy. <clears throat> All right. The last one, I want to just finalize and just cover the gospel and certain things about it. That is my plan. We'll see what happens. I trust these teachings that you now sit under will be of benefit to you and try and give you a solid foundation to trust the scriptures. God bless you. Thank you very much. Let's pray before I go.